Hi, I'm Dan Reed with the Community College of Philadelphia's Automotive Technology Program. Welcome to Car Corner. Today, we're going to be talking about oil. And in the past, I did a show where I changed oil as part of another episode, but I didn't really get a chance to talk about the specifics of what makes oil oil, why we use it, why it gets dirty, how you test it in the car, and things like that. So, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at clean oil versus dirty oil. And the oil gets dirty and the reason why it needs to be changed over time is because contaminations occur when the car is driven. As the car is driven, it's burning gasoline or diesel fuel. And in the process, some of those combustion byproducts actually get sent down past the piston rings and wind up in the oil. Over time, the oil also absorbs things like moisture from the atmosphere and acids that occur um, from different metal compositions in the engine. So after a while, the oil starts to turn black. The black is the oil actually doing its job. The oil's job is very difficult. It has to flow when it's hot, has to flow when it's cold, and it pretty much has to be the garbage man inside the engine, collect it, collecting everything inside the engine. And then once its hands are full, we drain the old oil out and put fresh oil back in its place so the process can keep repeating itself. So in a nutshell, that's why you have to change your oil. You just can't leave it in the engine forever. So this is my fresh clean oil. And if I shake that up a little bit, you can see that it, it flows very nicely. Um, it really just kind of runs off the inside. It's designed so it does kind of have a, a, an adhesive property to it where it's going to cling to surfaces inside the engine. So after you turn your car off, that oil is going to remain on the inside. It's not all just going to run to the bottom of the oil pan where it's going to you know, collect. You're going to have this uh, residue pretty much left on every surface inside the engine. So that way, when you start the car again, there's already a thin film coating everything when you start the car back up. And also, that's going to help prevent corrosion. If you've ever seen metal rust, um, that would pretty much happen to the inside of an engine if it didn't have oil protecting it. Um, again, there's moisture from the atmosphere, there's uh, detergents inside the oil, and that over time will start to cause rust formation occurring. So we need to have some of that lubricating properties on the inside to, to keep that oil together, that thin film sticking. This dirty oil, first of all, when I shake it, you're going to see that this kind of darker section right here, which is some of the oil sticking to the side of this, this oil is much thicker. Um, it's about the same amount. But as soon as I put it down, the oil really clings to the sides of the bottle. And part of the problem is, is that sludge buildup, if you do not change the oil, the sludge will continue to build and build and build until pretty much the oil can't contain those particles anymore. And it will start to deposit those uh, contamination, those contaminated particles throughout the engine. After you heat and cool the engine through several cycles, that becomes sludge. Sludge blocks the flow of the oil in the engine, and in the process, we pretty much lose lubrication. So again, can't stress it enough. Um, change your oil when your owner's guide recommends to change your oil, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. So what is oil made of? Well, oil comes in a couple different styles today. We have what's known as conventional motor oil, which is motor oil that is basically extracted from the ground as crude oil. It's processed. It goes through a heavy chemical process to basically clean a lot of the contamination out from the oil as it's pulled out of the ground. We then add a lot of additives to the oil, and it's put into bottles, sold on the shelf after it's gone through a whole battery of tests. Conventional oil is what we used for probably close to 100 years, a whole lot in this industry. You can still buy it. Um, and it's fine for a lot of older cars. Later, we came out with synthetic oil. And synthetic oil, the main difference is, is that it is laboratory made. Um, it may still have a base of some type of petroleum product. For example, we can make synthetic oil out of products like natural gas now. Um, so the oil itself can be much cleaner, and it has many, many more um, synthetic additives added to it and therefore, it's a very consistent grade, 
it uh, has a longer life. We can add more anti-wear items to the oil, making it last longer for modern cars. For example, synthetic oil may have a recommended oil change interval of 10,000 miles for some modern vehicles, whereas a conventional motor oil might only be 3,000 miles. Right there, the difference is obvious in terms of how longer, how much longer the oil can actually last in the engine, how, many, how much more contamination it can hold. And while synthetic oil, in terms of its final cost when you buy it at the store is more expensive than conventional oil, you have to remember that you're probably getting maybe two, two and a half times the life out of the oil that you would if it was just a less expensive conventional uh, type of oil. So another misconception about synthetic versus conventional oil is that they're not mixable, that you have to completely drain one out before you put another one in. They are completely mixable, and in fact, there is oil on the market which is called a synthetic blend, which is already um, a synthetic and a conventional oil pre-blended in the bottle together. It helps lower the cost a little bit. It gives you some of the advantages of a synthetic oil um, while keeping the costs a little bit low. However, not every car should just run synthetic oil. If the manufacturer specifies that the car has to run with synthetic oil, then that's your answer. You have to run the car with synthetic oil. If you have an older car that came from the factory with a conventional oil, that's probably okay to run a synthetic. It's, it's, not, gonna, it's not gonna directly damage anything in the engine, but given the age of that car, you might actually notice uh, possibly leaks occurring. Synthetic motor oil is very, very slippery. That's part of its job. And when we have an older gasket or seal in a car that's gone through several thousand heat cycles as you drive, when you switch over to a synthetic, you may find that that really, really slippery oil finds its way through the passages and actually starts to leak. It's not the oil's fault. It's really the fact that the gasket or seal had failed on the car probably a while ago. And the older conventional oil that you were running just sort of almost acted like a glue, uh, for lack of a better term, sort of holding things together. When you add the synthetic oil, flushes everything out, and now you have a little bit of a leak. Again, it's not gonna be detrimental to any of the metal parts in the engine, but my advice is, is if you have been running a conventional oil for a very long time, and you have no problems, you really don't have a reason to switch over to a synthetic oil. It's, it's not gonna magically make the car last uh, you know, four times as long or anything like that. Just keep doing what you've been doing. Obviously, changing conventional motor oil when it's supposed to be changed, you can have a car that lasts a very, very long time using just conventional oil. But again, remember if the manufacturer says this car must use synthetic oil, then that's what you have to use. So let's take a look at just what oil does inside an engine in terms of preventing wear between two parts. So. I'll move those bottles aside. And what I have, so I have two small components here. These are, these are called lifters. And these lifters uh, run up against a camshaft inside the engine. So the lifter here that I'm pointing at, um, you can see the surface of it is very, very smooth. It kind of has a circular wear pattern to it. And that's, that's normal. That's normal wear over time. Um, this lifter over here has a, a line that's actually an indentation in the top of it. And this indentation, uh, right where I'm pointing to, is going to be caused by a lack of lubrication. So the way oil lubricates things is it acts as a barrier. And I'll just take a piece of uh, post-it note here to kind of demonstrate. The oil is going to sit on top of the item. And when we have an opposing item, like this camshaft that would come down on top of it, it acts as a barrier between the two surfaces. So you don't actually have true metal-to-metal -metal contact while the oil is flowing in the engine. Um, if we did have a lot of metal-to-metal, -metal, true metal-to-metal -metal contact in the engine, engines would last 15 minutes and, and they would pretty much be destroyed. Plus, every time you would turn your car off, um, this film would disappear, you'd start your car back up and you'd have what's known as a dry start. 
Um, dry starts can occur if the engine has been sitting for an excessively long time, um, but generally speaking, you know, your average person that drives the car once a day, maybe even just once a week, you're not going to have uh, dry starts being an excessive problem. So it acts as a film, a protective barrier between these two surfaces as this camshaft would be rotating around. The top of the cam would push down on the lifter. That in turn would open some valves, let air and fuel into the engine. Um, and that, again, going back to my lifter with the little line in it, that's where that little line got caused. This lifter stopped rotating due to a lack of lubrication and the camshaft would come down and hit right on top of that piece. And over time, it actually started to erode some of the metals away and we have this little indentation. So motor oil pre prevents essentially friction. No kidding, That's, we knew that it did that. But it does it on a molecular level. If you could imagine, again, a little film here, but the film was made of little teeny tiny bearings. That's what oil does at a molecular level. It acts as a surface between the two. And the two surfaces actually don't touch each other. We have this layer of metal, uh, layer of oil in between the two. So that's what oil does to prevent uh, friction wear inside an engine. It also has um, different properties into it that are going to be added to the oil when it's manufactured, again, to prevent sludge buildup, prevent acid buildup inside the engine, and a host of other types of um, special mixtures that are going to be added by specific manufacturers. Okay, so another job that the oil has to do is the oil is actually going to be cooling components inside the engine. It's going to be taking heat away from uh, some, some heat away from the area around the cylinder walls and in other parts, parts of the engine. The oil is then going to be circulated and it's going to drain down through the engine to the bottom of an oil pan where it's going to sit, kind of hang out in the wind a little bit underneath the car as it's going down the road. Cool air is going to dry, uh, pass over the oil pan. That's going to help lower the oil temperature. It's then pumped back up into the engine into an oil filter and let's take a look at some different types of oil filters. I have some oil filters in front of me and talk about some of the different constructions of oil filters and some of the different types that are actually on the market. The, uh, the most common type that people are really familiar with is this design and this is what's known as a, a spin-on oil filter and it has a threaded center and then a, 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 a rubber neoprene gasket around the outside and this gasket goes up against the engine block. And the way this works is dirty oil is passed through these smaller holes. It passes through a filter media on the inside and then pushes out through the center of the uh, filter and the oil flows through the rest of the engine. Um, these spin-on filters, we use them for many, many years and they come in all different shapes and sizes. And of course, a specific manufacturer is gonna recommend um, you know, a specific filter number, a specific model. So one size does not fit all for this at all. And we got away with these. Um, we use these in the industry. We still use them uh, for some vehicles. Other types of filters, this one is just a different quality um, manufacturer. It has a, a different colored gasket on the inside here. There's a unit called the anti-drain back valve, which I'll show you in a minute. I have some filters cut apart to show you what's inside. And with these types of spin-on filters, we can have a filter cap. This is used, you put your, uh, your 3H drive ratchet or extension in there. And this is designed to fit over the little grooves over the top of the filter. And then you can remove the filter very easily. It's important to remember that we only use this to remove the filter. Um, we don't use this to put the filter back on. Most manufacturers recommend that you, once you contact the base of the filter, um, you do like three quarters to one turn and that's it. If you over tighten the filter, you'll distort this O-ring and you'll have a pretty massive oil leak once you start the car up. So just follow the directions. Most of the time it's actually on the box with the filter or printed on the filter itself. These two types of filters on the inside have a couple different types of filter media. This is uh, two examples of some filter media that you might find in some filters. This brand, uh, whatever filter it came from, really, really solid construction, 
has metal end caps, has a band to actually keep these pleats together. And remember that the dirty oil is going to flow here, go around the outside, pass through the filter media, and then come out through the center when you start the car. So you get what you pay for. Here we have another manufacturer. Um, this one is has pretty much just cardboard end caps. They're cardboard glued to filter media. Filter media is not as well put together. I, I've seen some of these where the pleats actually get pushed over flat due to, to uh, high oil pressure. And you know, it's, it's good enough to get the job done, but I do believe you get what you pay for in terms of an oil filter. And generally speaking, the more expensive the filter, the higher the quality of construction on the inside of the filter. And if you're gonna really drive your car hard, or if you use um, synthetic oil that's gonna be in there for a long time, the filter itself is an important part of that, that system. The filter media <clears throat> will still allow the oil to get black. Oil is gonna get dirty as it's, it's, it's cycled through the engine. If the filters were perfect, the oil would always be clean. But the example I give in class is, it's a lot like a coffee filter and how it's constructed. If you put coffee in a coffee filter, if the filter did a perfect job, you would get clean water out through the filter but I don't want clean water out through the filter. I just don't want coffee grinds coming into my coffee cup. So that's pretty much what the filter does is it filters out large particles and lets the smaller particles through, which is the coffee. Um, motor oil filters work the same way. They're going to trap large particles, but not be so restrictive that it stops the flow of oil altogether as it goes through the filter because we need that oil, even if it gets a little bit dirty, to still do its job until it gets really, really time for a change. The other type of oil filter which we have on the market, this would normally be attached to the engine, is what's known as a canister type oil filter. And these have come out, they were pop popular with European cars starting about mm, maybe 20 years ago, and they're finding their way more and more to the market. And the advantage is, is that this outer casing is always attached to the engine. So basically you could Imagine if you had a filter, this outer casing, we throw away and recycle that, put a new one on. The advantage is, is the materials stay with the engine, so it's a little bit cheaper for a filter. And in terms of waste, it's a better idea. There's a cap, and they usually have some type of large, um, almost like a, a nut shape on top that you put your tool on. You unscrew this, <clears throat> and there's an O-ring on the inside that comes with the filter that you uh, pull off and replace after you lubricate it with a little bit of engine oil. And then the actual filter element itself pops out. And this is what the filter is. So when you get an oil change for a canister type car, you might be expecting this in the box and instead you get this and uh, an O-ring and you're kind of confused of exactly where this goes. Well, it lives inside this canister. Just be careful if you do an oil change with a car that has a canister type filter that you make sure that if there's any types of springs or O-rings or seals or anything like that that uh, have to be changed, they are changed, they're not mixed up. The order of these components is very, very important to make sure that the car has consistent oil pressure and the filter can do its job. And most of the time when you put these guys back in, they sort of snap into place. The last thing that is important that I've seen a lot of people make a mistake with is that there is a torque specification for this cap. Um, most people don't have a torque wrench and they, they really crank down on this cap. And I've seen these housings, which are sometimes made out of plastic, break. And if you break this, uh, you're not driving. Um, you're going to have a huge, massive oil leak while you're driving down the road. And if you over-tighten this, um, I've also seen these where they get tight and you actually shear this top nut off, and now you're stuck with an oil filter that you can't get to. So it's important to remember not to over-tighten these. And um, if you don't have a torque wrench, you've seen me use them in the past, this is a really, really important and, and good point where you go, gee, I should definitely torque the top of this filter canister because I, I don't want to run into a problem. Okay, so the construction inside an oil filter. Um, I have these on these, these uh, wire rails because we use these in class and we kind of pass these around and we look at some of the components inside the filter and it's interesting because a lot of people don't get to see inside oil filters. But this is the, the end cap where we have our, our spin-on 
point, and again, our dirty oil is going to come in through the outside, and then clean oil is going to come out through the center. And we have a valve on the inside here. This is called an anti-drain back valve, and this is designed so when you shut your car off, the oil doesn't drain out of the filter. Oil stays inside the filter, and because of that, when you start your car again, we're not refilling this filter before we get oil to the other parts of the engine. So it acts sort of like a, uh, well, it acts like a, 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 a check valve. It's going to allow that oil to stay in the filter and um, be there when you start the car up the next time. We then have the filter element on the inside, which we've, we've seen before. And then we have this guy in the top here, this little, this little piece of metal right here. This is called a bypass valve. Now I realize it looks like just a flat piece of metal. But one of the dangers that could happen is if this filter got so contaminated, if, if I really, really, really just never change the oil in the car, and it happens, there are people out there that let their oil go for 30,000 miles and never check it and they never change it because they just assume that having a car with a warranty means I don't have to take care of it, which it does not. Um, if this filter gets completely clogged, it would starve the engine of oil, and the engine would last all of two minutes driving down the road. So what happens is, is if this oil pressure starts to, if this oil filter starts to clog, it will actually push back and allow the oil that comes in that's dirty to go right back into the engine. And instead of having the oil filter block the flow of oil, the oil filter literally pushes back inside its canister and allows the oil to pass through. Both the, uh, that and the anti-drain back valve are important parts to have in a filter. And some really cheap filters um, may not actually have those components to, to have that protection when you need it. So if we look at another filter from another manufacturer, um, they have pretty much the same construction. Oops, get this out here. There we go. There's my... Um, my bypass valve, filter, you know, good solid metal ends on it. Um, this manufacturer even went as far as to actually use like a, like a glue type adhesive to really make sure that this, this um, filter element stays in place on the canister. And their anti-drain back valve is actually in the center of the filter. So it has just a smaller anti-drain back valve, but it's, it's still present and it's still there. So we'll take a look at a Another filter, and we see that the anti-drain back valve is, is not really held in place. It's just, it's, it's just sort of floating around in there. It's, it's pushed up against the bottom of a cardboard, uh, cardboard cap. The filter material is, is there, it's present, and then it has a large anti-drain back valve along with uh, another, oops, let me get that out of the way there. A, a, an actual physical spring on the back to act as a bypass valve right there, all right? So I think, again, personally, you get what you pay for when you buy an oil filter. Um, you know, obviously don't go broke buying oil filters, but quality oil filters are important. Uh, their construction is gonna, is pretty much gonna dictate, you know, their overall ability to filter. Um, if they're gonna function properly, if there's some type of defect and uh, that sort of thing. So now that we've looked at oil filters, um, let's look at different types of oil, different weights of oil, and what that means and why it's important. So motor oils, what do the numbers mean? There's a lot of confusion about the numbering system that motor oils are sold under, and it's pretty much one of the single biggest things that you have to pay attention to when you're selecting the right type of motor oil for your vehicle. Um, the first one that we're going to look at here is what's known as um, SAE, and that's Society of Automotive Engineers. And they basically come up with a rating scale of oil. And it's not to say that one oil is better than another oil, but it's the rate at which the oil flows. And to give an example of oil and how it would flow, if you were cooking and you had uh, some corn oil, and you put that corn oil inside a refrigerator, the oil would get very thick, it would congeal, and it would become so thick that if you had to pump it through an engine, you could imagine that it literally wouldn't flow until it started to warm up. If you take that same corn oil out and you let it get to room temperature, it starts to get a little bit thinner, 
and then if I put it in a hot pan, it gets still even thinner. And that's the normal process that oil kind of goes through. It starts out thick when it's cold, and then as it heats up, it gets, um, it gets, it gets thinner. Well, straight weight, what's known as uh, HD, heavy duty oil, um, is what's known as a single weight oil. And if you want to think of it, it's sort of like corn oil in the sense that when it's cold, it's very thick. As it heats up, it thins out. And the Society of Automotive Engineers, with the rating scale, they're basically saying that at the operation temperature of an engine, which is close to water boiling at 210 degrees um, or 100 degrees Celsius, that this oil is going to flow at a certain rate. And on that scale, they're going to give that the number 30. Straight weight oils are good for some motorcycles, air-cooled vehicles, uh, lawnmowers, and things like that. And the single grade oils are fine. They're good for those specific material for those vehicles. However, while they're cheaper, um, you should never run a single weight oil in place of a multi-weight viscosity oil, which what is what we recommend for most cars. Things like motorcycles and lawnmowers, you think about when you use those items, you generally don't ride your motorcycle when it's five degrees out, or you also don't mow your lawn when it's five degrees out. So the single weight oils their scale is not really taking cold weather into um, its calculation of, of how you, when that oil is going to be used. So, generally speaking, we're not using straight oil, straight weight oil for a modern car. Um, don't let the number fool you. If you take a look at it, this and you're like, oh, that's a 30 and, and, and that's a 30, it must mean the same thing. It doesn't. The multi weight oils. You know that you have a multi-weight oil because it has a W. And the W stands for winter. And the scale of measurement that they use to test the flowability of the oil when it's very cold out is a different scale that they use when it's hot out. So the numbers don't mean the same thing. Um, what they're basically telling us is that when it is cold out, this motor oil rates a five on the flowability scale. It is able to flow at temperatures that are very, very cold. When the oil heats up to engine operation temperature, it's going to rate a 30 on the hot scale. Now again, the scales aren't exactly the same measurement, so 30, you just can't do like motor oil math and subtract 25 uh, points from it and say it's now this. What actually happens is, is there's, there's improvers and viscosity um, improvers that are added to multi-weight oil that give it the ability to kind of do the opposite of what corn oil does. Um, when it's cold, it will still flow. It's thick, but it's still loose enough that it's able to be pumped through an engine. So when you start the car and it's five degrees out, the oil can be pumped through the engine and get to all the parts it needs to lubricate. Likewise, that oil, as it heats up, still is flowable, but it doesn't become so thin and runny that it stops protecting parts. And that's what this number is. This is basically the hot number. This is the cold number. And all modern automotive manufacturers recommend running a multi-weight oil. The lower the oil is on the scale, number-wise, the thinner the liquid is. And you might say, well, I want a lot of protection. I want a really thick oil. And the answer is not necessarily. Modern engines have very, very tight tolerances. And if you could imagine, if you took something like a cheese grater that had a whole bunch of little holes in it, and you poured a very thick oil over top of that cheese grater, it would take a long time for that oil to run through those little holes, as opposed to taking a thinner weight oil, which would run through the holes faster. Well, the danger is, is if you run an oil that's too thick for your engine, it's going to take it too long to be pumped through, and it might not even really fit through some of the orifices. The molecular makeup of the oil might not allow it to get to where it needs to be. In a modern engine, we have very, very tight tolerances, essentially very small holes, so we actually need a thinner oil to get to those components faster when you start the car when it's cold out. I've seen a lot of people kind of walk up to a parts counter and they have no idea what type of oil that their car takes, and they ask the counter person, and I'll tell you right now, the counter person really doesn't know off the top of their head what type of oil the car is supposed to take. They might actually ask how many miles are on the car, 
And if you say 100,000, they'll say, well, you need a thick oil because parts are worn out in your engine. And my attitude is, is that if you've been running the proper weight oil in your car from day one, uh, you pretty much use that oil the whole life of the car. You don't, you don't change the, uh, the ratings as the car ages. You don't have to do that. And it can actually be detrimental to the car. So looking at some synthetic multi-weight oils here, um, this is a, uh, a 5W30 which again, some manufacturers right, might recommend. We have a 0W30 and a 0W40, which is a really wide scale, which is to say that this oil is gonna flow very easily when it's cold, which is super important for some modern cars that have things like turbochargers. And then as the oil heats up, it's actually going to flow like a 40 weight. So it's not gonna get so thin and runny that it's gonna cause damage to those components. It's going to be able to keep that barrier of lubrication between the metal moving parts. Okay, so now that we know what the differences are between um, multi-weight and single-grade oils, if we take a look at what's known as a synthetic blend oil, that's what I talked about earlier, where we have an oil that's part synthetic, part conventional, and then we have oil that is really not marked what it is. And if that's the assumption of it doesn't say what it is, it's actually considered conventional motor oil. So while the numbers are different in all these, um, the fact is this is a uh, 10W40, this is a 5W20, and this is a 0W40. Both of these have 40s, okay. And you say, well, the difference only is not that far between 10 and zero. Again, if the manufacturer recommends that this is the oil that you must run, maybe to keep a warranty valid on the car or something like that, then this is the oil that you must run. You can't get away with trying to be cheap and just running a, a, a different type of oil in the car. So make sure you're running the correct weight and the correct type of oil in the car. And then the other question that I get a lot of times is um, things like oil additives. Um, should I add an oil additive to my car? And the answer is probably not. Most if not all manufacturers do not recommend adding any type of additive to the motor oil. The motor oil has plenty of additives in it and some of these aftermarket products exist. Maybe if you sort of want to extend the life of an oil a little bit or you know, they might have some kind of wild claims of that it's going to, you know, make the engine quieter or make it last longer. Personally, I, I do not, you know, advocate running any type of aftermarket lubricant additive for anything. I think the lubricants themselves actually do a good enough job in protecting the engine and making sure that everything works. And again, if you change the fluids when you're supposed to, um, you really should have no need for any type of cleaner or additive or anything like that inside the engine. Okay. So let's look at how we figure out exactly what type of oil our car takes. So in order to determine the type of oil and quantity of oil that your car takes, you have to refer to some type of a chart that might be actually from the owner's guide um, or a source listed online. And what we have for the car listed behind me is we have a two liter Ford Focus. Um, and the manufacturer's recommending for our year that we have here, 2009, that the car takes four and a half quarts of oil. Now, a lot of people just assume that cars all take five quarts or they all take six quarts or something like that. The fact is every car takes a very specific quantity of oil. If the oil level's too, too low, it's not gonna protect the engine properly. It's gonna actually cause the engine, to, uh, to engine oil to break down faster. If the oil level's too high, that's actually even worse because as the pistons come down, um, they run the risk of actually splashing oil up past themselves into the combustion chamber where the oil will then be burned. Um, if you find your car is low on oil, and I'll show you how to check oil in a, in a minute here, um, you don't wanna add five quarts if you find out that it's low. You wanna add pretty much a half a quart of oil, let it sit, and then check it again. But so we know that this car behind us takes four and a half quarts of oil. The next thing is, is that we're going to determine what type of oil the car is supposed to take. And here is a um, 
page from the owner's guide, and the manufacturer says that it has to take a 5W20 motor oil. On top of that, it has to meet a specific Ford standard. Um, a lot of times manufacturers will come up with a specific standard and you wanna make sure that the motor oil that you're using doesn't just have this number, but it also has, um, meets the manufacturer's specifications. That's usually printed on the back of the bottle. And if you do that, you know that you have absolutely the absolute correct oil for your vehicle. The other thing is, is that we kind of look for this Sunburst logo right here. This is called the, uh, the API Donut or American Petroleum Institute Donut or Sunburst. And it's a sign, it's a, a logo that says that the oil is basically made for a modern car. Now, as technology has changed, I'll we'll go to this next printout here. As oil has changed, um, some of the ratings of our oil scales have changed as well. Um, this printout is from the American Petroleum Institute, the company that, um, or the, the sanctioning group that basically certifies engine oils for the United States. Um, things you want to look for is that it meets specific service requirements for your vehicle, um, and it's going to clearly show the specific, the absolute weight for the, for the oil as well. As car technology has changed, the oils have changed, and while motor oil has gone through some real changes, um, the oldest standard for standardized motor oil is down here, it's SA rated oil. Um, this here says caution, they don't recommend using it, and it's basically used for um, engines before 1930. It's a really, really low old standard before um, gasoline was even not a real good standard back in 1930. Um, we bring this all the way up here to SL or SM, which are the current ratings of oils. And you'll see that here it says um, for 2010 in older automotive engines. If I have a car made after 2010, um, I can use this oil. However, if I have an older car, I can definitely use this oil. But if I have a newer car, Let's say I have a car that is a 2014 model, and I find some SJ rated oil. Well, right here it says that it's for 2001 and uh, older cars. If I put that older oil in a newer standard engine, it's not a good thing. The fact is the newer oils have different additives added to them because the formulation for gasoline has actually changed over the years as well as some of the manufacturing tolerances and differences that we use in a modern engine versus an older engine. To me personally, a car from 2001 isn't exactly old, but at the same time, it's also not new. And that's why you wanna make sure you picked the correct rated oil. So make sure that you have the correct oil for your vehicle. And if you're wondering, do they even sell that older SA oil grade? Um, the fact is they do. Uh, this was a motor oil that we bought at a, at, a, at a discount store. And on the front, it says that it's SAE 10W40 motor oil, made in the USA, great. You know, my car takes 10W40, this oil must be good for my car. However, if you look on the back, um, it's missing that, that Sunburst logo. And right here it says, API Service SA. Now, so this oil's good for a car if you have a car from before 1930, which I don't see a lot of cars driving around every day from before 1930. So just because the weight is right, you have to make sure that the rating of the oil is correct too. And to show you a contrast of another, another brand, um, that's the donut that we're looking for. And right here it says that this guy is SM rated oil. So this is oil for a modern car at this point. So this would be the preferred oil if the manufacturer specified it. Okay, so let's take a look at how we do some, some testing on the car and let's take a look at how you know how to check your oil. We're gonna check the oil now on our, our focus. And when you check oil, I think a lot of people think you can just check it at any time, car's hot, cold, whatever. The fact is manufacturers generally have a very specific requirement for checking oil in the vehicle. First off is that the car is off. Um, if the car has a physical dipstick located here on this particular car, um, 
The car engine should not be running when you check the oil. If the car does not have a dipstick to check the oil, some modern cars actually do not have a dipstick, you actually check the oil through the entertainment center of the car. There's usually an option, a menu option. You pull that up basically through the radio. You process the, uh, you tell the vehicle to start to check the oil. For those types of vehicles, the engine is actually supposed to be running. So if you're not sure, should the car be running? Should it be turned off? Make sure you read your owner's guide uh, to figure out exactly how to check your oil. But this car has a physical dipstick. Manufacturer says car has to be, uh, had to have been warmed up to normal operating temperature and then turned off for 15 minutes. And that gives the oil a chance to really stabilize its temperature and allows for all the oil to run back down to the oil pan. And the reason why that's important is because the dipstick actually measures the oil level down in the oil pan. So we've had this car, it was running. Um, we've had it turned off for 15 minutes and we're now ready to check the oil. It's on level ground. So I'm going to pull the stick out and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to wipe it off. I'm not even going to look at it. I'm just going to wipe it off and make sure that the stick is clean and I'm going to place it back into the oil. Make sure it's put all the way down and then I'm going to wait kind of a second, let the oil kind of go up, get around the stick a little bit and then I'm going to pull it back out and we'll see where we are on our dipstick. And this manufacturer recommends that it's between basically these two dots, the min and max mark. And it looks like we are in a pretty good area. Sometimes it helps to uh, move it back and forth a little bit and see exactly how much oil is on the, on the stick. But I would say that we are in a pretty decent area. If the oil level is below the minimum mark, at that point it is okay to add some oil. Again, some oil. You don't want to dump in uh, four or five quarts of oil. Pretty much on most cars, the distance between the minimum and the maximum is about, it's about one quart or one liter of oil. I tend to pour in half quart, wait a little bit, let the oil run down through the lubrication system of the car, collect in the oil pan before you take your reading again. You can't be in a rush when you do this. If the oil is severely overfull, um, again, that's a problem. You're going to damage the engine. So too much oil is, in a lot of ways, worse than not enough oil. Again, being a little bit low, the car is going to run. It, you know, you're going to wear out the oil quicker. It's going to break down quicker, but it'll be okay. Sometimes, if you pull the stick out and you find that there's no oil on the dipstick, people say there is no oil in the engine. Well, there's probably still some oil in the engine. The dipstick does not hit the bottom of the oil pan. It sits slightly above it. So the fact is you could still probably have two or three quarts of oil in the engine. They're just not showing up on the stick yet. If that's the case, um, find out where the oil went. Maybe it's leaking. And when you add oil, add a quart and then wait a little bit again for the oil to run through before you decide to add more oil after you check it. All right, when we go to fill the oil in the car, it's really not a complicated process, but the oil fill is located here at the back of the vehicle. This uh, manufacturer has gone as far as to make sure that you remember to put the correct weight oil in the car. This um, is going to help the engine uh, achieve good fuel economy. Thinner oils are easier to pump through the engine. They require less, uh, less fuel to do so. So running a thinner oil in the car is one of the ways that modern manufacturers help get really high fuel efficiency numbers. If you were to literally just put a thicker oil in the car at this point, um, your fuel economy would drop because it takes more energy to pump the thicker oil. All right, let's take a look inside the car of how you know if there's a problem with the oil system. Okay, so the customer complaint is that their oil light, which is located right there, is on the whole time they're driving the car. Now, we've gone through and we've talked about oil and we've checked the oil level and that's really the first step is to check the oil and make sure that it is, is, it is in you know, the right level. The second step would probably be to change the oil, but I know that the oil's okay in this car, so and the, it's got a good quality filter, so that's, that's really unnecessary. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go out under the car and we're gonna look at the oil pressure sending unit 
and see how we can test that. Okay, so our car has a problem. The oil light stays on while the car is running. So that we know now that the car has oil in it and we verified that the light is on. So the next step that we're gonna do is we're gonna check the wiring and make sure there's not some type of defect um, either in the instrument cluster or in the, uh, the harness. And what I'm gonna do for that is the oil filter is, is located here. My oil filter is attached to a housing, attached to the block and the oil pump. And I have this little, this little sensor screwed in here with a single wire. That's my oil pressure sending unit. Now what that is, is that works like a switch. And when oil pressure is applied to the switch, what it's gonna do is it's going to remove a ground and that in turn signals the oil light to turn off. So right now, you can imagine, there's my switch, and it has a little pintle on the back side of it. And what happens is, is right now the oil pressure is not in the system. So right now the oil light would be on with the car not running. And when we apply oil pressure, we're gonna push this little plunger back just a little bit like that, and it unseats the connector and it would turn off the oil light. That's what's happening inside that little switch right there. And, and the easiest way to actually test that switch is to simply disconnect this connector. And I have a jumper harness here. And the jumper harness is just a wire harness that I'm going to attach to the inside of my sending unit. I'm gonna actually put it into the harness side of the, uh, the connector. And then I'm going to ground out my connector on the engine block like that. Um, once this is set up, oops, let's loop this through here so that way it stays connected. Let's see, fish this around here. Make sure that guy stays plugged in. What is gonna happen with this is when I go back up and start the car, um, my oil light should be on the whole time the, uh, the car is operating. So with that being the case, let's go back up in the car and check and make sure that this harness is set up and connected properly. So now we have the jumper wire set up on the oil pressure sending unit harness. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start the car and run it and my oil light is out. It went out, which means that the vehicle, the wiring harness is intact and that the sensor could be at fault or I could still have a low oil pressure concern. So let's go back under the car and take a look at what's involved with setting up the oil pressure, uh, oil pressure tester. So we got a light inside the car. So what I'm gonna do now is uh, I still don't know if the problem is the sending unit or if it's an actual problem with the oil pressure delivery in the vehicle. And what I'm gonna do for that is I'm gonna disconnect my harness here, my little test harness, and I'm gonna unscrew this oil pressure sending unit and install a gauge. Now when I do this, I have to be aware that the car's a, a little bit warm because it was, war uh, was running. Um, so I'm gonna get a little bit of oil kind of coming out of this pressure sending unit. I'm not taking the filter off and I'm not draining the oil out of the car, but I'm still gonna have some oil coming out of there. So I have a drain here to capture some of my waste oil as it comes out. Let's go right there. And I'm going to unbolt my oil pressure sending unit. and my oil pressure sending unit is just threaded into the side of the filter housing. It's usually located somewhere near the oil filter on most vehicles. There we go, a little trickle of oil coming out. And 
I'm going to screw in my gauge adapter. And what this is going to be is this is going to be a, a, a physical replacement gauge um, that's going to give me a real-time oil pressure reading. I'm going to have oil pressure traveling through this hose to a gauge assembly. But what I have to do first is I have to thread it into that housing. And manufacturers make lots of different sized connectors and that type of thing. I want to make sure that whatever sized housing I have, that the threads match perfectly because if I damage the threaded housing when I go to screw the pressure sensor back in, I'm going to have a nice mess on my hands and an oil leak that I can't fix without replacing that flange. So I'm going to screw in my hose and thread this guy in here. Just kind of give it a little wiggle as I turn it around. And once I get that hand threaded started, I'm going to continue to hand thread it until it stops on its own. And then I'll just snug it down with a wrench. I don't want to over tighten it. But at the same time, I don't want to have oil spraying all over the place when I run this test. snug this line down. Okay. And now I'm going to take my pressure gauge, my physical oil pressure gauge, and I'm going to attach that to my line. And I'm going to clip this underneath the car here, so that way I don't drop it. And let's see a good spot to clip it is right there. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put the car down, we'll start it, and uh, then we'll come back and see what the reading is on our pressure gauge. All right, so we're back in the car. I'm going to start the car up, and we're going to get out here, and we're going to check and see what our oil pressure gauge is now reading. So, car's running, and the manufacturer wants to see at least something greater than 20 PSI on our oil pressure gauge at this time. That tells me that this car has good oil pressure, and that the problem is my oil pressure sending unit is defective. So this car really doesn't have an oil pressure problem, it has an oil pressure sending unit problem, which is good, because if it did have an actual oil pressure problem, that would mean that there was damage that occurred inside the engine and depending how long the car was driven, it, it might be a real problem. So what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna put the car down, turn it off, and we'll change the oil pressure sending unit and then we'll go back in the car, put everything back together, and we'll see if our light turns off and its system's working normal now. So, we replaced the oil pressure sending unit. I'm going to start the car. Oil pressure light comes on. Start the car. Goes out like immediately. So I know that that pressure sending unit was the problem. So it looks like this one's fixed. Um, I'm Dan Reed. Thanks for watching Car Corner. Take pride in your ride and drive safely. How am I going to put this car down? Anyway, okay, you're going to find out. <laughs>